Thank you, SB. And welcome everyone to this month's Connect with Remedy webinar. Before we get started, during the presentation, if you have any questions, you can ask them in the Q&A pod. Our panelists will be able to answer those questions. And at the conclusion of this webinar, the recording and all Q&A will be published within a week of today's live showing. Now, this topic today will be on the Remedy 1808 feature release, what's new? And at this time, I will turn it over to Peter Adams. Go ahead, Peter. Thanks, Greg, uh, and uh, welcome everybody from my side, also on behalf of the entire Remedy product management team, and you see the representatives uh, listed here on the slides. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to today's webinar about uh, the feature enhancements uh, of our latest 1808 release. Uh, now we know, you know, as BMC is investing heavily into Remedy and we do frequent releases, uh, can be sometimes uh, difficult to keep track of all the new things that are coming and, you know, this webinar is an excellent and uh, easy way to really uh, understand uh, the new capabilities and the value that uh, BMC is delivering. So I hope you stay with us throughout the entire webinar and uh, again get some further insight uh, into what is, uh, has been delivered with this uh, recent release 1808 uh, that we released by end of August. Um, now, as Rex said, there's an opportunity to ask questions, and we have not just the, uh, the PM representatives here as panelists, but also some technical experts that can answer, you know, your technical questions about these new features. So, uh, by all means, make use of this option, and then we have some um, live Q&A um, at, at the end as well. Um, now, uh, quick glance at the agenda. It's very similar to how we had done, you know, previous. Um, uh, what's new webinars, I want to give a little bit of context in the beginning about this release uh, and how it plays into the bigger, you know, BMC strategy in the service management area. And the main portion is really about, you know, the different uh, functional areas that we improved and that's covered by the, the different PMs uh, who are the experts on, on the respective areas. Uh, we do give some additional references, you know, where you can find additional information about these new capabilities, uh, but it's, you uh, at, at the end when we are wrapping up, and, and as I stated, uh, we'll have some live QA at the end. Um, now, um, again, 1808 uh, Remedy release is part of our bigger, you know, strategy in the service management area, and, and one important aspect of that strategy um, is the um, announcement of BMC Helix, the Helix uh, that we've done in the June timeframe, early June timeframe. Um, if you recall, Helix is uh, our end-to-end um, -end cognitive service management uh, suite that we deliver uh, through a SaaS uh, delivery model here. And, you know, as part of that announcement, we really emphasized uh, the uniqueness, uh, the differentiators, uh, how we do this differently than um, other vendors in the market. And these tend around the three C's, as we call it. Uh, so, first of all, cloud. And, you know, as you can see here, we have a number of different components, as well as add-on solution delivered as a service as part of that suite, right? Uh, the second C is containers, right? We are containerizing our software, which allows us to uh, support this SaaS service on the cloud of your choice um, as a customer. And we support AWS and BMC today, and, and uh, Microsoft Azure is coming very soon. Um, and then third part is the cognitive aspect. So we're building lots of cognitive capabilities into our, into our suite, right? And again, as we see a continued interest in our customer base uh, around this SaaS delivery model, we wanted to educate uh, the market about uh, what we're doing here, you know, about the excellence of our SaaS delivery and about the uniqueness uh, that we have, right? Uh, but make no mistake, we understand that as today, many of our customers uh, are using Remedy on-premise, and so, you know, for sure, you know, the capabilities that we you know, present uh, to you today, um, you know, are available as well for customers that are running Remedy on-premise, right? And uh, um, uh, some of these, you know, additional capabilities around cognitive, you know, as they're part of the Helix suite, can be used in combination with Remedy on-premise or Discovery on-premise or, you know, Digital Workplace on-premise. So we have a, a number of solutions that 
that we support our premise and we uh, continue to support, right? Um, uh, but they can take advantage of these additional uh, cognitive capabilities that we deliver as part of the Helix suite uh, through a, a hybrid deployment model, right? Um, again, very important that uh, we continue to support and, and invest in the on-premise deployment option as well, right? Now, um, when we say leading solution, right, it's not just us saying it. We're very proud that, uh, you know, in the recent uh, August 2018, uh, Gartner ITSM Critical Capabilities Report, uh, Gartner confirmed you know, our leadership in terms of these critical capabilities, right? We have the, the highest score, 3.85 um, out of 5, so significant lead um, uh, in the advanced maturity INO use case, which is really the use case that's most applicable to our uh, enterprise customers that we're targeting with Remedy. By the way, Remedy you know, is, is leading in, in uh, 4 out of 5 use cases overall only in the low maturity uh, one, um, you know, is, uh, which is not really our focus, right? We, we're not uh, uh, the number one here. And uh, one thing that's, uh, that we are really proud of here as well is our leadership uh, specifically in the AI ops category, right? Which really reflects, you know, what the vendors are doing in terms of providing cognitive capabilities uh, to improve the, the ITSM uh, outcomes, so to speak, for for the customers. So we have uh, a number one leadership in that AI in that new AI ops um, category, but uh, uh, overall in, in in a number of different functional capabilities. The majority one, BMC's uh, Remedy, is the number one solution here. Um, so again, a good confirmation that uh, that you're using the leading ITSM solution in the market, whether you use it on premise or in SaaS, right, you have the leading capabilities here across a variety of functions. And, you know, hence we are, you know, investing heavily to retain that leadership, right? Uh, uh, we have no intention to giving that up. And as you can imagine, we're focusing very hard on making sure that we contain the, or retain this leadership. Um, and part of that is, again, our delivery model that we focus on delivering new functionality on a regular basis. Uh, and for Remedy, as you know, we have a six months release cycle. Now, those of you who pay attention, you know, will notice that this 1808 release is somewhat a, a release out of step, uh, so to speak, um, because we just had an 1805 release uh, before. So that is true. Um, it does not reflect a general change in our strategy. We want to continue with that six months cadence, but it was somewhat a out of step release where, which we used to shift the release cadence by one quarter, right? And uh, main focus here is on allowing us to deliver higher uh, R&D productivity, uh, and you know, ultimately that should result in, in more features being delivered to you, right? Uh, so uh, we, we have done this for a purpose. It's a bit of an unusual step, right? We go back to a six-month cycle um, after this 1808 release, and, and the next one is 1902, as you can see here on the slide. Um, but again, we did that for a purpose because we do want to have a, uh, ultimately a faster delivery of capabilities to you. Um, now, when it comes to the functional focus areas of that release, you know, that, of course, um, is, uh, again, focused on our strategy to deliver and augment the traditional ITSM process-centric capabilities, which we still support and, and build out, right, with, you know, trades that make up a, a modern digital solution. So, you know, that represents our investment in multi-cloud and, you know, user experience, et cetera. That's the, the middle layer where we've invested for a number of years um, into, you know, again, transforming our solution into a modern digital uh, digital service, right? Uh, and now more lately, our investment in cognitive capabilities that we really see as transformative for the ITSM space. So uh, again, the capabilities that we are delivering with this release um, are supporting this bigger, you know, uh, strategy that we have in the service management area. And specifically, again, we're going to talk today about, you know, our new capabilities in the cognitive and multi-cloud area um, that are part of that 1808 release cycle. Uh, we're going to talk about our enhancement that we have in the user experience area, both in Smart IT and the new CMDB UI. Uh, and we're going to talk about our continued investment into the Remedy platform. And as part of that section, we actually have a little bit of a glimpse into our investment in containers, uh, even 
even though that's today only available as part of a SaaS offering, we wanted to um, give you a little bit of insight of what's going on in that area, and uh, that is covered by uh, by Rahul in that uh, in that last section, right? So um, with that, uh, I want to hand it over to Pradeep to get started on uh, the first area of uh, cognitive and, and multi-cloud enhancements that we have in the Remedy Suite. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Let me just jump right into it. Um, we, as Peter said, we are the leader with the Gartner's AI ops capability. So we are continuing to invest in, in this area. We have really, really exciting capabilities. Um, there is tremendous value save, um, um, cost savings um, with this feature that we have put in place in this release, as you will see. So I, I will just jump into it. One of the biggest um, way we think, um, and we have seen many of our customers, they are creating, their users or customers are creating incidents is through email. And there are a lot of, um, you know, those, when those, Emails come in to remedy, they, an incident is created or, or change is created. In this release, we're supporting incident and change with this capability, and we will be adding work order later on. But what happens is once these come in, because they have very little description or, you know, you, you do not, you have to manually triage those um, incidents to assign to the categories you need, the template you may need, um, you know, support so that rest of everything else, you know, that happens in ticket life cycle can happen effectively, right? So you have a set of people who are monitoring these. What we, we have done with the, with this, um, cognitive capability using IBM Watson in this release is that we allow, we, if you, if you turn it on, then these, we will auto apply it an incident template or a change template. Um, right, um, you know, as the email comes in. And once the template is applied, everything, as you know, how quickly, it's, you know, all the elements, required elements and categories and, and are pre-sold and you have the, the ticket going through, through the life cycle. So you do not really need any manual triage. Um, we have done some studies for um, so some, some of our customers and we see in one of, one of our use cases we have seen 45% of the tickets are coming in through email, and they they feel it it's a tremendous value add to them. So I'm really excited about this capability. Um, it basically takes away um, it takes away a couple of um, FTEs, um, depending upon of course your volume, your your operations. So this is this is huge. You know, inbound email coming in automatically gets the right template applied based on um, natural language processing from IBM Watson uh, machine learning engine, right? So if the user send, sends you anything different, right? A, a, you know, for example, you have a VPN problem. Someone says virtual private network. Someone says connect cannot connect to corporate network. The system, if you train it right, will be able to detect those and will do that nicely. So that's uh, that's one feature that um, that that has tremendous value uh, that we are shipping. Then the next one up is um, if you're aware, we introduced um, on auto categorization through Smart IT in prior releases, right? So what we have done here is, um, you know, there was a, a manual invocation of of um, that action for the user to be able to request. Um, categorization recommendations from IBM Watson. What um, we, are, we have done in this case is now we have completely automated it. So when, if you turn on, obviously you have configuration options. If you turn it on, then in a smart, a smart recorder, you the system will automatically, you know, give you those recommendations and bring that recommendations to you in the categorization field that you can look at it, it will tell you that this was brought in from IBM Watson or from the machine learning engine. So um, this is much much easier um, and, and quicker way to get those recommendations right in there early on so your agents do not really need to spend time on um, on invoking that that manually. So those are the two two capabilities that um, 
that we have added tremendous value. I said uh, email, uh, email feature is applicable for incident and change, and work order is pretty much on the roadmap. But we're, um, what I want to do is quickly show you this demo, get in the system, and um, from there on we can, uh, we can. So let me see if I can share my. So um, you are now seeing this this an email inbox that I have set it up. This is right our user, our customer. They are in their inbox, and they want to. They have an issue, and they want to send um, and create and get support. How do they get support? Is they create an email in this case. So they are in in the email, and they say, "Hey, I." Um, you know, so this is something we have set up, right? In most cases, it's help desk at XYZ or company.com. Um, so what we want to do is basically uh, I have this description here that say they have a VPN. Um, so they send us an email saying this is um, this is the problem they are having. They are not able to connect to um, VPN using VPN. And what what we there is we just send the email right that's what you know many of our users are used to today right I mean we have DWP we have chatbots we have Slack we have um, text messaging we have Skype all of those um, channels available through VMC through as part of Remedy offering and so you you know but on top of all of that we know many of our customers are used to sending an email right and we provide service through that because you know so so that's that's what's just happened now we know this is um, capability in remedy email engine that exists for years that we can process that inbound email we can figure the context out we can create an incident out of it and we will um, and so what has happened what is the improvement that we have done and where we plugged in the cognitive capability is what I want to explain a little bit. Um, so as the email comes in, um, you know, as, as Remedy Email Engine evaluates it for um, for further processing, at that point, when we directly created an incident with whatever information that was provided by the customer, we we we. We, what we do is we make a call to um, IBM Watson, right? So for this instance, Remedy um, um, is hooked up to our cognitive application and, through, and to IBM Watson. The training has been done. So, um, you know, the different descriptions of, um, you know, variations of descriptions that uh, exist uh, or the common uh, tickets that, you know, are representative sample of, your incident data, for example, and template IDs have been trained. Watson has been trained with those, right? So you have those um, already in Watson. So now Watson can apply these natural language processing right on top of those, right? So if there's a little bit of a variation, they, you know, you can set up your confidence interval, and based on those confidence intervals, you you have a ticket, a template ID that's been applied by the system. So that's uh, that's in general how the cognitive capabilities work. Um, obviously, there is a, a setting up as part of the one-time setup, and maybe regular sort of um, retraining. We have provided tools that allow you to extract data. From remedy, get it into system and nicely, and uh, and get into IBM Watson. So, um, so if you see this new email just came in, which says, "Hey, I this incident um, five five seven has been created," and uh, and you know, and they basically say, "Now let's go into Smart IT and see um, see what is." It. So this new, if you see this new incident five five seven has been created and it showed up. So this is how your um, um, in a system, your 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 users are going to know, um, or or service desk manager is going to know this this has come in. Now, because we applied a template, you will see that you know all of these things are pre-populated, right? So, user did not provide none of this information. We system just uh, just did it, and uh, so so that's basically. If you look at the template field, I mean it. I may not have that it exposed. You will see. And by the way, we put a comment here, right? So um, 
that VPN issues template is applied by cognitive service management. So we built a pure, complete solution around it. If we were not able to find a template, then we put a right message in there. So there may be cases, obviously, it is dependent on how you train Watson. But if you are able to train the machine learning engine with the right set of sample data, you you do not have to do this task manually that you have been doing for a number of years. So that's number one demo. Uh, the next one, what I, I want to do is go into Smart Recorder and show the capabilities. So this is the one where real time, while the agent is recording a, a ticket, we can get cognitive in and we can um, we can get cognitive in and we can really get get to the uh, the auto categorization here. So I'm just going to go into the second demo here, Mary Man. Um, let's let's go into to this one and let's just say say this is the issue that uh, that Mary Man wants to. Reports. Um, so this is the. So what happens? You know, smart recorder. I, everyone is familiar. There is no other interface for agents, really, anywhere. People are trying to copy it. We have, um, you know, this is such a phenomenal innovation. But um, if you see here, when I say create incident, we go to this draft screen, right? Where the ticket is not yet saved. But then in this case, if you see. We, while saving, what we did is we called machine learning capability. We got the op cat and the product cat, and we tell you that this brain icon, that this came in through cognitive. So that's capability number two. Um, and, and basically, you know, the system is as flexible as possible, and, and it gives you a tremendous set of options and automation in this case. So thank you very much on this piece. What I want to do is jump into, uh, now I want to jump into uh, the deck and the next part of the, next part of this uh, should be there. So um, jumping gears, talking about multi-cloud service management. Uh, um, there's a whole lot of new capabilities that we have. So, um, I know you have seen this slide before, but I want to make sure that we understand the context um, from multi-cloud service management perspective. We are focusing on this complete life cycle of um, of um, in a ticket ticket a service management life cycle. We are we have added a bunch of things in 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 the current capabilities, but we our intent and our vision is to complement remedies world-class capabilities with multi-cloud service management capabilities for cloud-based cloud services, right? So all this complete life cycle from discovery to service to collaborate, monitor, knowledge is what we, we, are, we are after. Now, um, in this 1808 release, if you see, we have added, you know, the, you, you, you know this diagram where this is more like a hub and it lets you integrate to other systems right now for ticket brokering, ticket consolidation, DevOps use cases. We have added two new vendors in this case. Zira Service Desk is a new ticket consolidation use case that we have added, and BMC Remedy to Remedy is another one that we have added. So we'll just, just jump into it right now. Um, so Zira Service Desk, you can monitor Zira Service Desk, and based on that incident from Zira Service Desk, you can create incidents and remedy, you can collaborate, we ship out of the box flows, and those are fully configurable and extensible. So I'm gonna get into the demo for this, so let's um, let's move ahead with the slide. Um, the remedy to remedy use case, again, the, I know we have offered other capabilities from before, but what we have found out that when your vendors are using remedy, there is opportunity to collaborate in much more elegant and effective way possible. So we have this, um, you know, multiple, you know, uh, MCSM remedy instance can connect to multiple remedy instances and get push an incident out uh, or monitor remed those remedies and bring an incident in and then collaborate, share comments, share activity notes, uh, and have status sync. So this, this allows you for that, that complete use case um, that you, you, you know, between the system, between remedy applications. Um, Again, this is an example. You 
when you have an MCSM instance for Remedy, you can view the vendor ticket information right in here, the way we have designed for other vendors, right? So um, pretty much, you know, you have the pertinent information that you want to see. You have ability to drill down if you did, you're doing this for within your own multiple instances of Remedy if you have. So, so you have a whole lot of, um, you know, capability and smart IT integration. Pre-built smart IT integration, which is configurable, by the way. So if you want to display a different set of attributes for vendor ticket information, you can choose to. Um, another enhancement we have done is for the service cloud use case, which one of our customers are, um, uh, are highly interested in and is, is using it. They have, um, you know, attachment support. So now you can have attachment come in on an incident from service cloud, or you can push it out from activity node from Remedy. And just recapping the Zira use case that we had, um, um, we have, um, you know, we have shipped this in 1805 release, but there is so much tremendous uh, customer interest in this one. You can hook up one Remedy instance to multiple Zira where you have a development operations there. So, you know, with, between incident or change on the Remedy side with issue object on the Zira, and you have complete flexibility on where the flow starts. So I just wanted to recap. This is a really, really hot capability. Many, many of our customers are looking at this integration, and many are looking at different ways. This is a prepackaged integration that we are shipping. We have already shipped, which is basically, you know, turn it on, and there you go. That is the kind of capability we are pre-built mapping with, configura with, with configurability and extensibility to the manifold. So um, this is an example of how the Zira integration will show, which is standard. If you see, you have actions built in a smart IT. You have ability to share directly with Zira, uh, and you have the Zira ticket information on a smart IT. So now we're, we're going to have two demos here. This is the first demo. I'm going to just cover the demo scenario quickly. We're going to look at Zira Service Desk, create tickets from Zira Service Desk into Remedy Incident in Zira Service Desk to Remedy Incident. Then we're going to uh, send a comment from Remedy to Zira Service Desk, and then they can respond from Zira Service Desk, and then we can see the status thing. So that is one demo that I'm going to do. And then second one I'm going to do is um, Remedy to Remedy, right? So you have a vendor Remedy instance, and we're going to take it, we're going to take uh, that Incident has been created automatically. Monitor, we are monitoring that vendor and bring it and create uh, an incident and do the collaboration use case. So, um, so what I'm going to do is uh, share my screen, and I need to be able to go here. Okay, so let's first go to Zero Service Desk, and I have a quick video. So let's just ro roll with it. So what we have is, um, you know, I'm, I'm in Zira Service Desk, right? I am creating an incident. This is how the Zira Service Desk incident is. I have configured the system for email and collaboration service. We're monitoring any ticket in there, pick it up, and create an incident and remedy. So this is we have just created the ticket in Zira Service Desk. Um, I'm just navigating to the Zira Service Desk ticket. To, um, yeah, so what, as we monitored it, we picked it up, we created, multi-cloud has created the ticket in, and uh, then we we put this incident ID from Remedy on the label field in Zira Service Desk. So I went to Smart IT now. I see you go to Smart IT, you can see that, um, you know, that ticket shows up, right? So, um, in this case, the ticket shows up, um, you know, with, with that value, we see the ticket shows up in, in, in Smart IT. We have uh, Zira Service Desk ticket details, like uh, any other vendor, you can, you know, and then the pertinent information that you want to know, right, the status and everything. Now, if you want to send a comment, our agent in Remedy asking them some questions, right, what's the exact error message. Um, and then you have a button in the Smart ID share with Zira Service Desk. You post it, and so it's being sent over to to Zira Service Desk. And if you, um, if you go to Zira Service Desk, uh, 
um, you know, you see that comment has come in, what is the exact error message, and the user from there on can, can respond and say, hey, this is the error, error that I'm getting, cannot log in, and this, then we will bring this in, and uh, yeah, so we'll bring it in, and you, your, your agent in Smart IT can can see that easily. So that's 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 what you see here. That's exactly the kind of the capability. I and and then if you if you go further, what what's going to happen is, you know, if if the if, you know there is a terminal status sync, right? So if the ticket was resolved, then we are uh, we're monitoring and zero service test ticket, and we will. Um, let's say this one. So here that now you're saying the ticket is done, and I I say hey, so the zero service hey the, I, I, the issue is resolved. I don't need help anymore. Maybe so in this case because there is a status update, what we're going to do is look at that important status update, recognize it, bring it into remedy, and take appropriate action and show. Is showing Smart ID that hey, the status has been updated. So, so if you see, you see there is a, uh, here, and then if you see the service test ticket details, you can you can see that um, you know status is done. So that's that's one use case. I think it's fairly similar to the number of demos we have done. Right, the kind of framework we have gotten now in place for supporting a vendor, and we display the vendor ticket information, we do the status thing, we can share comments, collaborate between the two agents. So that's that's the capability. Let's jump into the second video for Remedy to Remedy, which would be um, similar. I What I have is that this is right now, I'm in a vendor remedy in, instance, right? So this is Smart IT, they have Smart IT, the agent is creating a ticket, and we I have a, Trigger conditions set up on opcat, right? A specific value in opcat is when I'm going to pick it up and and, and going to send it. So let's do this um, quickly. We have Mary Man is a customer. Okay, so this is some incident from vendor ITSM to MCSM ITSM, right? So as you choose a value. Right, if you choose a specific value, right, this is how you can set your system up. Um, in this case, I say request ITS and incident. Again, this is completely configurable for you. So now this is vendor ITSM. Now I, I'm in MCSM ITSM uh, where you, the ticket came in and it shows that this is the ticket. This came in from the vendor system. See on the right side, if you see incident created from vendor remedy ITSM, and then you have the vendor ticket details right in here. Um, you can drill down to if you have access to those systems in case you need to. Um, you can share an, an activity note or a comment. And uh, this is kind of, yeah, and then you can, from the vendor instance, this will be pushed over to the vendor remedy instance. And then you can go to the vendor remedy instance and see the comment came in, they can respond from there and it will come back. So the both the agents can collaborate. So literally that is, um, that's the capabilities, uh, exciting set of capabilities, um, lots of customer interest um, with respect to these ticket consolidation use case and DevOps use case. So um, with that, I would like to hand it over to um, we go to John Hall. As we uh, continue to build out Remedy, uh, we, we've been investing significantly on an ongoing basis in the smart IT user experience, and 1808 is no exception. One of the things, of course, that smart IT uh, ha has you know, Smart IT has kind of changed the front-end user experience uh, in comparison to mid-tier, but we, we've always acknowledged that we we were, we still we're going to extend on an ongoing basis the configurability of smart IT. It's not yet, it hasn't to this point been as configurable, as customizable as mid-tier. And in particular, one of the focus areas has always been the client side. 
Now, uh, mid-tier's client-side configurability uh, is always very powerful, <laughs> but it's also always been a little bit of a headache because in a typical modern browser application, it's not typically expected that quite as much processing, quite as much code will be executing in the browser on the client side. And, you know, we see uh, web application blueprints which limit the, the client side really to just validation. Well, in, in the real world, in, in service management, quite a few people want to be able to build things that happen on the client side. And so the big focus for us in smart IT has been to enable that as much as possible. And we've done that up to this point with what we call provider actions. So if you're not familiar with these, one of the great powers of provider actions is it's actually filter driven, if you know your remedy workflow objects, which means it runs on the server. The server is doing the heavy lifting, but in the last couple of versions of Smart IT, you've been able to use provider actions to make things happen on the client side before you save the record. So unlike a typical filter action where the filter executes on commit of the data, and of course you still have full access to use those in Smart IT. Provider actions let you do things on that appear to be running on the client side before you say the record. And, and in particular where you might have previously used a set fields action in Active Links to do a data lookup, uh, provider actions give you that ability. The development that's come with 1808 builds upon what we'd already done in 1805, uh, now allowing you to you know, not just have a button or a user menu option that triggers that provider action, but from 1808, you can actually define logic which causes those provider actions to execute. So again, a little familiar, it sounds a little bit like what Active Links could do. You, know, you could trigger those to run when users perform actions on certain fields. Now with provider actions, our, our logical scripts enable us to do do something very similar, and, and we can you know, trigger things when field values change or even when field properties change. Uh, and that's what I'm now going to show you uh, as I move into a demo. So let me uh, just take a moment to share my browser. And I'm hoping you're now seeing uh, Google Chrome and this instance of Smart IT. So firstly, uh, let, let's just have a quick look at what is configured on this. I mean, what, what you're looking at here is a very standard ticket, by the way, no, nothing remarkable about this. But I just want to drill into the configuration and show you a couple of things that have been set up on this environment. So firstly, we have, uh, under our actions, we have a provider action defined. And of course, this this is already been defined with a, a few filters on the server side. Um, I'm not going to go into all that in this demonstration because we've, we've shown that in past iterations. But what, what I want to show you is what, what specifically has changed. Now, as well as linking this, you know, rather than linking this to the menu on the form or linking it to a button that we create next to a field, I've got this execute on condition. And what we've done here is we've actually put in a number of things here. You know, So if, if the service type field changes, then we're going to trigger the, the, the validation of this expression. But also, just, just for fun, I want to show you some of the new um, some of the new capabilities of this. It, it's not just based on the data in the fields, but also the, the current state of the form. So we can have you know, a, a little bit of um, cascading logic, and this enables you to kind of you know, define things once and, and, and build logic that executes them in different circumstances. Uh, we've got, for example, um, th these, uh, these, these triggers which enable us to have you know, to, to have an expression which checks if a field is currently required or if a field is currently hidden or if it's currently read only. So we have a, there we go, we have a number of different ways we can build logic that determines whether that provider action is called and performs those operations on the record as we work on it. Um, and then just to let you know quickly, you know, to, to tie in with those things that we've defined here, if I look at some of the, the properties of these fields, again, this is a, not a brand new feature at all, but it, it, we, in, in a, uh, from Smart IT2, you've been able to make um, dynamic things happen. So um, if, for example, I, I look at customer phone number here, that gets set to required when the status is in progress. If I look at the customer site value, this gets set to hidden if the status is in progress. And if I look at the contact information, our email address is set to read only 
if that's in progress. And, and the reason I'm doing that, if you recall, those tie in with the logical condition that we've built as an example on this provider action. So we need all those things to have happened for that provider action to trigger. So let, let's make those things happen. Let's come back to this record. So firstly, um, I'm going to do a few things. I'm going to set that record to a status of in progress. And as soon as I do that, you'll see those dynamic behaviors happen. We've removed that site. We've made that site widget hidden. So, uh, you know, now when I save that, um, then uh, we, we um, no, let's, let's set an assignee, apologies. So we set that to, to hidden. Um, I'm also going to change the priority because one of our conditions was that the priority is high. So by setting the priority to high there, I can, um, you know, by, by setting the impact and urgency to the appropriate values, I've set that priority value to high. And we also need the service type to be user service request. And I want to keep an eye on the description field here because when I set that to user service request, I've now immediately fulfilled the conditions for that provider action to run. The fields are the right properties and the status is the correct value and I've changed the data in the field that is, is linked to that on change operation. And, and immediately what's happened now is, is Smart IT has called that backend filter workflow and run it, as you saw, pretty much instantaneously here in the uh, in the client. And of course, being filters, I, I could have done um, I could have done data lookups from custom forms. So, for example, you know, if I wanted to kind of if I built custom workflow in the back end that might go and look up who was on call for a particular record, I could populate a field with that, or I could find site access request information, or or really anything that you can envisage that you might want to have running on the client side before the record is actually committed and the, the back end ordinary filters start to progress the process. So it's a it's a very open ended, open -ended capability, capability just, as, just, as, just as you'd expect from uh, remedy configurability. And um it is designed to enable a very significant part of what people did with active links in the um in mid tier. Uh, along with the you know, so that along with the the functionality we've already delivered about um, field property manipulation and setting values to fields and all the other things that you can do in Smart IT takes us a very long way in, in that direction towards what mid tier was able to do in the uh, in the client side with customizations. But importantly, it does it without loading up the browser with a lot of uh, dynamic execution, which uh, you know, well, mid tier. Still work great. Always, I feel set a little bit of a cap on how how good we could get that user experience, how snappy we could get that user experience. So, uh, a nice, um, hopefully, a, a, you know, a really nice set of new tools for you. Right now, dynamic provider actions are on the incident form, and we were aiming to roll that out to the uh, the other the other record types with uh, configurability in in our next releases. Okay, so uh, let's stop the sharing, come back to the presentation because I want to talk about some other things that have uh, been updated in the in the smart IT user experience. We, we continue to you know, build on customer feedback and deliver ideas in each release. And, I, and, and there's a couple of nice examples. I mean, this is, this is only, of course, a, a fairly short release cycle between 1805 and 1808, but we've been able to do some nice improvements in addition to the to what you've just seen around provider actions. And it, it comes down to, you know, some, what, what we focused on is, is some areas where customers, you know, when we work with customers, we, we, we've seen that it's, we, we've had some small, annoying difficulties which impact productivity. Um, in this example, you know, for service providers, we have the option now to, to limit recommended tickets to those that are from only the same company. Um, the reason for this is that it's uh, we, we were hearing that you know, having smart IT's ability to kind of automatically recommend similar tickets to look at is great, but often the relevance of a ticket from a different customer company is generally likely to be very low. So by reducing that list to the same company, we immediately make it a lot more optimized. Secondly, the, you'll see on this example, um, uh, the, the upper example here, that when you the recommended knowledge alongside a record, either in Smart Recorder or 
in the uh, in, in the ticket view itself. Just a, a straightforward change. It gives us the the, the status and the version number, um, and this is just based on feedback that you know when when there are multiple versions of a knowledge article uh, available here, you know, one one current published version, but also an updated version being worked on. The fact that it's very easy to show both at once in the search results, and often relevant to show both at once in the search results, is great. But because we didn't show easily which was which. It was an extra click to go and validate. Um, so we, we've we've done those things just to make the user experience better. And another example of, of you know of a number of examples in this in this release, when you're using uh, incident templates and you select a template midway through creating that incident, you we we improve the way the the template text is appended to what's already been typed, so you don't end up kind of being thrown. Down to you know having having a lot of stuff thrown into your line of sight and having to to scroll around and find what you've been typing and start again. Um, again, this is just three examples here of user experience enhancements based on customer input. Uh, I like showing these because we like that customer input. Please keep creating the ideas, keep keep giving us that input, and you know we will continue to go visiting and looking for customers and observing and bringing the UX team alongside you so that we can continue to refine that experience. I just want to talk quickly about what this means, uh, these, these new Smart IT releases mean in terms of compatibility and, and where you need to be. Uh, the biggest change in terms of the Smart IT backend for, for a good while came with 18.05. So back three months ago, when we um, we moved away from using MongoDB for what we might call the social feeds, the the ticket updates, the, the being able to tag our coworkers and customers and have that kind of uh, that conversational messaging within the tool. As with Digital Workplace, we've made that move away from Mongo as a specific backend database for that and brought everything into the the core relational database, and and that makes. A, a, that provides a fairly significant dependency on ITSM 18.05 for Smart IT 18.05 and beyond. So with Smart IT 18.08, uh, it remains compatible with 18.05, but that it's still based on that start point, although you do need to install patch 4. Uh, we do have direct upgrades from as far back as 1.6. Um, and uh, just be aware of the, the upgrade order, you, you need to also Keep uh, digital workplace on that 18.05 and upwards versioning. So, uh, as you see, you know this is um, those of you familiar with that fairly big step that was made up to 18.05. That step becomes a, it is now remaining a foundational step for further upgrades of smart IT. You don't you don't need to bring ITSM up to 18.08. It, it does need patching, of course, to align some new uh, new capabilities with what you've seen in the smart IT front end. Okay, so with that, um, I'm going to hand over, I believe, to Stephen to talk about the uh, the updates that have been made on CMDB. Hello, everybody. Um, so in 1808, we have made some updates to the uh, UI, otherwise I wouldn't be talking about them. And what we delivered is um, our initial revision at the user permissions model for the new CMDB UI. Uh, so that you have your configuration manager and other users um, having the appropriate views of the UI, and I'll do a quick demo of that in a moment. Uh, and additionally, what we've done is provided configurability around the KPIs that we in, we introduced in 1711. So you can now configure the completeness KPI. You can do exclusion of classes in the um, integrity KPI, etc to make it more tailored to your business um, and what is important to you. So those are the main two changes we've made. I'm going to do a quick demo for you uh, and then be handing on to the next presenter. Okay, so as we can see, we're at the uh, new CMDB UI login screen. I'm going to log in as Alan. Alan's a configuration manager for uh, this CMDB, so uh, we'll pop in there. And as you can see, he gets the full configuration manager dashboard. Um, he gets his integrity, completeness, the uh, workflow, et cetera. And the new feature for Alan really is the configuring the dashboard parameters. 
So if we have a quick look, um, new element that's been added to configurations around KPIs is for completeness, being able to exclude classes from the completeness calculation altogether, being able to exclude classes from the duplicate uh, element of the KPIs, and being to exclude classes from the orphan calculations. So this gives you the ability to decide which classes are important to you. You're not evaluating the whole CDM every time. Um, and tailor it more to what your business is, what your business focuses on and the kinds of CIs you actually track in your CMDB. Back up at configurations, if we go back into configure dashboard parameters, we have completeness. So on the left hand side we have the class list. You don't have to scroll obviously, um, you can quite happily go in and search for your classes business service and here what you can do is you can add new attributes. We've taken default attributes um, but you can add new attributes that exist in the class so you can decide if they are that requiredness as part of the completeness calculation. So now just to illustrate the, the um, permissions differences back to Alan's dashboard but if we log out as Alan and quickly log in as Bob. Bob here is an incident, an incident coordinator or a service best person. He's not the configuration manager, but he needs to search in the CMDB. So when Bob logs in, what you see is a stripped down screen. Um, by default, he's presented with the search and query interface and is prompted that he has to search. He can't do anything without searching. Um, so we're going to uh, have a look for computer systems. Here we have some computer systems. Actually, what I'm going to search for is business services. So he's going to go and have a look at services. Let's go see what we've got. And he's going to look at the online retail banking service. While we just wait for that to come through. It's not very easy. Right, here we go. So. Um, he searches for the data that he's looking for, and when the service renders, he's able to explore the service, have a look through. As you can see, the discount equity brokerage service is highlighted because that's what he searched for. He gets all the standard hover over, look and, look and feel, and he can show details as he's searching. But the main difference is he can't get to anything else. All he can do is search and look through the CMDB. He has none of the dashboard access, none of the other access that uh, Alan had when I was logged in as Alan. So these are the actual permissions and configuring the permissions for this is all explained in documentation on docs.bmc.com. Um, but we wanted to illustrate to you that we now have this permissions model. There is um, further work to do on that as we add new capabilities to the CMDB user experience. Um, but as requested, we now have a way for non-configuration managers to use the new UI and we provided the KPI tailoring uh, that was on our road. Now handing over to Rahul. Thanks, Stephen. Let me go ahead and share it. Yep. So when we talk about announcement to platform, the first one in the list is new authentication option for REST API framework. So when building integrations with Remedy, uh, one of the common requirements is to build fully automated integration between Remedy and other system. And this end-to-end -end, uh, uh, automated integration will also require seamless authentication. Now, if you were to use a uh, plain text password, encrypted password, or for that matter, even uh, JWT token for uh, REST API integration, you may be challenged with organization security policies uh, that doesn't allow using static password beyond a threshold. Uh, and similarly, the JWT tokens are short-lived for you know, the same security reasons. So to solve this authentication challenge and make Remedy platform further REST-friendly, uh, we have added support for OAuth-based authentication for REST APIs. Essentially, you can authenticate a user through OAuth framework by, you know, there's a mechanism of refresh token and access token, thereby you don't need to send password frequently, but still you can automate you know, the, the entire integration flow. And here we use uh, Remedy SSO as the OAuth provider. Uh, RSSO has been supporting OAuth specification for last few releases, and we are leveraging it 
for the purpose. The next one is about smart reporting uh, update for ER platform customers, uh, specifically who have built custom applications on top of ER platform. So as a background to this discussion, uh, I think all of you know by now that you know BMC has this smart reporting option released few uh, few versions back uh, where all remedy ITSM users customers are entitled to use smart reporting for their in-app reporting operation reporting needs. However, this uh, new smart reporting option was not available to AR custom application users due to licensing entitlement. Uh, the great thing is with 18 OH release of AR platform, uh, users of custom applications, the remedy custom applications are now entitled to use smart reporting uh, for a limited seven number of users. So essentially administrators or uh, you know, the other roles uh, <clears throat> like reporting analysts can access smart reporting application to build semantic layer reports and then they can share uh, this reporting content with other users and they can use you know some of the mechanisms available in smart reporting like you know putting it on FTP, uh, doing the email broadcast or you know embedding this the entire reporting content in the external portal. Uh, to make it work we have made changes in onboarding process so that's where you'll require a platform to be upgraded to 1808 where seven users from a new group uh, that's called Smart Reporting Custom uh, App Group in AR, uh, those seven users will be onboarded in Smart Reporting. Uh, this is in fact you know, one of the top rated idea, idea in the community and we're happy to uh, address this. The next one is update on RSSO, it gets a handful of uh, user experience and security uh, updates. Uh, the one uh, small but useful change is ability to add custom HTML links uh, to RSS login page. So while it is possible to completely rebrand RSS login page, uh, to simply add few links to RSS login page, you can use uh, this RSS admin console. Uh, like you see on the screen, I have added two URLs for register and password reset uh, just below the login button. Uh, that will take users to another portal outside of RSSO. So, uh, you can add links to internet, you can add link to let's say identity management portal or any other URL uh, by simply adding a couple of lines of code to admin console. RSSO also get uh, another enhancement in the area of uh, able to control uh, Simultaneous user login. So now RSS is getting used beyond Remedy application for single sign on, and some of those integrations require that uh, be able to limit number of sessions per users. So RSS admin has now control to define uh, the number of sessions, or uh, in other words, in you know, a session quota for all users in their organization. Uh, by default, the behavior does not change, so the value is set to zero. Uh, so that you know you can have multiple simultaneous login, but whenever uh, they want to enforce this behavior, they can set this value to uh, the number that they desire. Uh, another one is uh, kind of you know securing RSS application from brute force attack, particularly for admin accounts. So at a server level, we have provided a mechanism by which you can define the number of incorrect password attempts uh, for admin account before that account is logged. Uh, this is again you know, more for securing admin users uh, so that there are no unauthorized login that happen. Uh, additionally, if you know, the account gets locked out, the other admins can unlock that account from the admin console. and. Uh, other change you know, to supplement this was uh, we have added capability to create more than one RSS administrator account uh, so that you know in your organization you can have each administrator with you know their own login to RSS administration area. The remedy management console was uh, added in remedy 1805 release. Uh, again, you know it has a ton of capabilities for managing remedy application. And the aim of uh, you know that console is to empower uh, remedy administrators to efficiently manage the remedy deployment that typically consists of multiple servers in a server group. Uh, the same remedy management console also includes you know the server group dashboard, and uh, that dashboard has 
visualization of that show number of records that are pending index or another one that talks about uh, application pending load uh, you know uh, number of record pending in application form waiting to be processed and so on uh, so this dashboard uses a remedy flashboard technology in the back end uh, there was no way to add a new flashboard metric and visualization to this console so it was like a, uh, what we provided out of the box was what you can use in this release we are making it uh, more configurable where you can add uh, additional remedy flashboard for you know any other metric that you want to uh, track in the sub uh, remedy management console uh, flat dashboard the the big difference uh, here is uh, while you are going to use remedy flashboard for all you know kind of calculating that kpi metric the visualization that you uh, see on the screen are actually done using a na uh the using a non flash technology so uh, visualizations are actually rendered using a new charting library c3.js uh, uh, so overall experience when you are you know configuring it remains same so you add a new kpi configure it in the dev studio uh, difference is going to be at the run time so instead of using uh, adobe flash it will use this new charting technology uh, also so the visualizations in this starting uh, uh, library are you know visually uh, in my view are visually much better appealing than you know the existing flashboard one uh, where we are going with you know the overall thing about uh, you know the flash is uh, we are clearly moving away from flash technology for remedy component because uh, as many of you know adobe has already announced end of life for flash in year 2020 Uh, and web users have seen challenges with using flash currently in the browser because of you know security settings so uh, we will eventually kind of you know move some of those flash dependency to some non flash technology in the future now key thing about you know uh, remedy 18 over release is you know our approach for uh, upgrade so we have tried to simplify itsm upgrade uh, particularly if customer is upgrading from itsm 1805 release uh, before i talk about that let's understand what's available to you as part of 1808 release so all platform component including ar server uh, that include mid tier smart reporting cmdb smart it remedy sso are available as installers uh, essentially you you know the way we have been doing the installer upgrade you run installers and you get to it you know it specific change to call out is you know this itsm applications uh, including srm and slm where these are released as deployable d2p packages so there is no installer for itsm srm and slm uh, in 18 you know it release on epd now how how this will play out for customers who are currently on you know let's say 8.1 version 9 version 90 or you know 91 version they can directly upgrade their uh, various components like you know the server air server mid tier smart reporting cmdb smart it remedy sso directly to 1808 using installers uh, in fact uh, customers who are already on a 9x version they can use the you know automated zero downtime upgrade for upgrading ar and cmdb when you are upgrading your itsm application including srm and slm to 18 you know, they need to first upgrade to 1805 release and once you are done with you know the 1805 upgrade using installer you import and deploy 1808 deployable packages for itsm upgrade for customers who are already on 1805 uh, release you know earlier adopters of 1805 they will be able to upgrade their stack uh, very rapidly in fact uh, they can use automated zero downtime upgrade for ar and cmdb to 1808 and for its map upgrade they need to uh, import and deploy 1808 deployable package in fact uh, this can be achieved you know uh, in the, the zero downtime for its map applications because these are d2 packages now so we are essentially making sure that we are uh, you know all customers are dealing with one itsm upgrade and customers who have recently upgraded to 1805 have relatively small effort to upgrade their itsm uh, when moving to 1803 so uh, 
this led for the elaborate you know, this ITFM upgrade process when upgrading from 1805 release. Essentially, you use a Remedy deployment management application to import and deploy ITFM packages, uh, which in turn uh, use single point deployment framework in the back end for upgrade. Uh, this deployable package for ITSM upgrade uh, comes with additional advantages uh, as compared to installers, such as the process itself is fast, uh, comes with a rollback in an, any event of unforeseen issues, and ITSM apps can be upgraded without downtime uh, for you know this upgrade. So what we covered so far is you know the highlights of 1808 release. Uh, I'm going to kind of you know talk about a uh, another session here, which is kind of you know bonus session to talk about uh, BMC Helix Remedy, but the focus here is more on the container technology as how we use this for powering our you know the BMC Helix uh, Remedy as a service. Uh, so on different forum we have talked about what BMC Helix Remedy is all about. So I'll not kind of you know. Uh, go with all the details here, but I'm focused on that container technology, which is a key part of BMC Helix. So at high level, container technology has two key roles to play in um, BMC Helix. One, containers enable us to offer portability. Uh, as you might have heard before, with BMC Helix, you can have a choice to run your service in cloud of your choice. So you can choose between BMC Cloud, AWS, or Azure. Uh, this is made possible with the container and container orchestration, uh, which are platform agnostic, and hence same container runs consistently on different clouds. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, leveraging container is truly the secret sauce for our cloud of your choice tagline. The two containers uh, also offer a ton of other benefits for deployment. And uh, if you do, you know, some uh, web search, you'll find how containers are helping organizations in uh, making, uh, you know, easier and better deployment. How it brings developer efficiency. How they bring support efficiency. How infrastructure efficiency is uh, supported by containers. Uh, for us, one of the biggest benefits that containers and you know the container orchestration offer is infrastructure efficiency. Uh, essentially, what containers do is they make uh, more from the same infrastructure. They dynamically shift workload between servers, and overall, we can uh, utilize you know this utilization of servers improved. So you know that's more of you know the dense computing. So for our discussion today, the and you know the overall context of remedy deployment, I'll focus on two uh, key use cases. One is uh, provisioning, and then you know scaling. And uh, this is like, you know, uh, provisioning and scaling is, you know, how we install upgrade remedy suite today. So uh, clearly customers typically would spend days to, provide, you know, to uh, kind of you know, get the hardware provision their remedy deployment. Uh, and at very high level, this would entail running multiple installers, running patches, configuring uh, multiple environment uh, setting, changing remedy application setting, setting up server group, setting up load balancer, and so on. Uh, this provision in experience will, uh, you know, in the demo you'll see uh, shortly that uh, simplifies by significant magnitude uh, when we use container. Uh, let me show you know, how it works. So I've connected to OpenShift cluster here. Uh, uh, you know, some of the things like, you know, we have created Docker images uh, for, you know, different components of Remedy Suite, which are already loaded here. There are, uh, you know, deployment script uh, in, you know, the Kubernetes world, they are called Helm Chart. Those are already added to this OpenShift cluster. Uh, so I go and I just run, you know, that command to, uh, you know, start the deployment process. So, you know, just deploy.sh and you'll see some of the you know the scripts start running here. Okay, so the the process you know typically takes somewhere between you know uh, seven to nine minutes. So the process just started here. I'll kind of you know, let it run. So I have taken a snapshot around you know after eight minutes or so, and you see that you know uh, there are these three uh, platform. Uh, containers which are uh, running. So we have you know, given three containers you know, with different roles. So there is a admin server, FTS server, and user server. So these are up 
these are up and uh, these are in fact you know, up in up uh, in just in a seven minutes or so. Right. So now that these are up, uh, I'll run another command to get port for this. So you know this service uh, command gives me uh, you know the port for platforms and you know also for mid tier. And I'll quickly make sure that you know the service is actually up. So let me go to a browser and quickly check if I'm able to log in here. So RSS is installed, so the authentication is redirected to RSS. So I log in, and now it takes me back to mid tier. Uh, you see that port three double zero three zero here. So this is you know what it takes for you to start or you know provision a new remedy uh, with with you know the container technology. So you know from you know the time scale of you know days or uh, like you know multiple hours it takes to you know just get that. Uh, now we are talking about uh, you know getting the entire system, including all the web component, you know, or remedy assessor, smart reporting, bit tier, uh, smart reporting platform, and you know, it's different uh, uh, the FTS uh, user facing server, integration server, admin server, all of that in you know barely seven to eight minutes time frame. So when what happens in the back end is uh, you know the, when we have done you know this the whole containerization what we have done is we have used the dockers uh, as a container technology and we use kubernetes as orchestration engine for managing you know the, the provisioning and operational upkeep of the container uh, what we have done in the back end is we have created a script that will run and deploy application component and these are commonly called as you know, help chart Helm chart in Kubernetes world. Also, we have defined roles for different servers and defined a sequence of deployment in Helm chart to ensure that you know all of the deployment dependencies are taken care of when container orchestration engine uh, initiates pod for any service. And as we saw that you know we have kind of reduced that entire uh, provisioning or deployment uh, time by you know. A significant magnitude, and we are talking about you know a few minutes it takes to start your uh, remedy suite now. The other use case that we'll talk is you know the scaling. So one of the challenge that we have is remedy application lacks elastic scaling that matches application demand. So what will be done to counter this is customers will spend significant time in capacity planning to predict the peak usage and uh, it would typically uh, be like you know we'll uh, provision infrastructure for that high watermark usage you know something that uh, we will hit in the organization you know maybe once in a day you know nine o'clock in the morning or you know once in a week when you know we get the maximum load uh, but for rest of the day or you know the, the rest of the week that infrastructure is underutilized uh, with container, we are able to provision for only infrastructure that's needed at that point of time. Thereby, it reduces overall footprint as well as it reduces you know the operating cost for running a remedy. So, uh, with container scaling is kind of you know a separate uh, ball game, or you know it's a completely different ball game. Uh, it's, the scaling is available at in you know, a single click. The entire operation of scaling. Uh, for you know different component will take uh, like you know just a minute or so uh, in the container world. So we'll we'll see that in action. So uh, this time I'm going to use GUI. Uh, let me show you. Okay. So what you will be able to see on the screen is uh, OpenShift. Uh, so this is essentially Red Hat OpenShift uh, management plane uh, that we. Uh, that we use uh, so that we can achieve customized solution uh, as when we run Helix Remedy, and also it enforces uh, you know the RBAC control for operation stuff. So what I have already running here is you know I have like in the Smart ID deployment here, and you can see that you know there's a Smart ID slave which essentially is you know the user facing uh, pod which is already running. So when I go to specifics of this slave, it will. Show me that how many pods are currently running. So, 
uh, on the screen, you should be able to see that in you know, a one blue circle with you know one pod which is currently running. So at this point of time, I see that you know there is a workload coming for Smart IT. So I manually decide to scale up this right now, and I'll talk about you know what it uh, does. So I'll just go ahead in from UI and you know uh, start. Uh, scale of operation and it tells me that you know there are two parts uh, one is already running the other is you know coming up so it will take uh, roughly 60 seconds for you know this could uh, for this to come up so let me kind of you know talk about this so the scaling that i have done here is all manual thing right so uh, i'm kind of you know quickly checking it in the uh, the console and you can see that you know the last uh, row it's still one by two, so it's still uh, coming up. So the one uh, scaling I talked about, uh, you know, shown on the screen was manual one, but you can also very well, uh, you know, automate this process where, based on memory, CPU, network usage, or other application indicators, uh, orchestration engine can very well add or remove nodes at runtime without any manual intervention. So it can you know keep watching, monitoring the some of the parameters and it will it can you know scale uh, application or you know parts uh, for that peak usage or it can even scale down when there is a lean demand for it. Okay, so this should be here. So now you can see on the screen that you know there are two parts and if I go back to uh, you know the Console here, it shows me that you know the the last line here, which talks about you know there are uh, two parts running for Smart IT. Now I'll quickly uh, you know talk about the other things that we you know spend significant time is you know although we can you know get the application up there, we still have to you know go and play with you know the load balancer setting and all of the other thing. Uh, in the container world, this is all automated. So if I just try to look for you know, the service detail, you can see that we still have one. Single entry for smart IT, and you know then uh, Kubernetes has already kind of you know worked to make sure that you know although there are two parts in the backend, uh, you know uh, the community will take care of you know managing the load across it. So this was like you know how scaling can be achieved in you know less than a minute for all your server components. Uh, sorry, uh, the web tier. Uh, similarly, for platform uh, scaling, it takes you know another minute or so. So, but again, you know, it's like a matter of minutes and not you know the days and weeks to scale Remedy application. So, for some of you who are interested to know what really changes uh, in you know what change in the backend, you know, to support for Remedy to support it um, for. Containerizing the web layer, right? So Remedy Mid-Tier, Smart IT, Smart Reporting, uh, RSS was relatively easy because these were uh, well encapsulated web application by designing. So we're able to you know create those as separate containers. Uh, when we started containerizing AR server, that was you know the most interesting thing because simple things that we take for granted in the VM world uh, do not hold true in the container world where containers make it provision and deprovision auto automatically. Uh, ER licensing, you know, that uses MAC ID for validation uh, is need, needed a change because, uh, you know, the MAC IDs are assigned each time a pod start and, you know, MAC ID will be dynamic for a container pod. So it kind of, you know, is now changed to use the database host uh, ID instead of, you know, the MAC ID. Uh, similarly for logging, uh, since logs will be wiped Along with the container pod, we are now using ELK, you know, the Elasticsearch uh, Oxstash and Kibana for remedy logging in the containers. Uh, integration in UDM, which uh, require file system access, are uh, kind of no-no in the container world. So we have, they they have you know changed. You know, UDM is now modified to read this file from persistence layer uh, instead. Again, uh, you know. Uh, a lot that we can talk on this topic at greater length, but uh, the purpose of adding this uh, kind of you know, the bonus session was really sharing a glimpse of what is changing in the remedy on its uh, next milestone of being a containerized application. And hopefully that purpose is achieved uh, with this update. Uh, before Peter summarizes uh, you know, the session, as a reminder, all of the things that we talked about containers are used uh, internally by BMC today as part of you know the BMC Helix remedy for our own operations and you know DevOps team. 
uh, and while we intend to make containerized remedy suite available to customers to use in their data center, that's a topic for future. So with that, Peter, uh, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Rahul. Um, yeah, I think you could probably also see that, you know, aside from just converting uh, the Remedy software into a container format, so to speak. There, you know, uh, there is a, a lot of best practices to talk about, and that's one of the reasons, again, why we're initially offering this mainly in uh, in SaaS only. Uh, we do want to make sure, you know, before we provide this uh, to all of our customers, uh, that we have all the processes and best practices uh, fully built out, exercised, etc., and can share that as part of just giving you the the container version, so to speak. Right, so um, um, again, that's a big part of the reasons why, at least at this point in time, we uh, focus uh, purely on SaaS in that area. But uh, again, it shows that the the Remedy platform is certainly fully compatible with all the modern approaches to operating um, a software environment uh, uh, through container approaches. Um, and uh, again, it reflects the uh, superior capabilities of and the flexibility of the Remedy platform, right? Uh, so again, just to uh, to wrap it up again, you know, 18.8 release uh, a number of, even though it was a shorter release uh, for us, a number of valuable capabilities uh, that you've heard uh, throughout the presentations and the demos today around our new cognitive capabilities. And just to reemphasize again, uh, the cognitive service is integrated into the Remedy um, solution at a platform level. So not only can you uh, use what we showed you here in the demos with our out-of-the-box use cases, but you can also implement your own custom use cases that make uh, use of that machine learning uh, service that we provide with BMC Helix Cognitive Automation, right? Uh, and then again, BMC Helix Multi-Cloud Service Management uh, with uh, these uh, exciting new use cases around ticket consolidation uh, in general covering this, this you know, increasing need to be able to integrate and collaborate Remedy with many other solutions, right? Uh, you saw the progress that we make around um, the ITSM user experience, again, both with uh, Smart IT as well as with the CMDB UI and, again, some, some valuable enhancements we provide for the, for the Remedy platform, right? Um, so, um, as always, uh, you know, this kind of presentation and demo can only touch on the high-level uh, topics. It's a very concise way to learn about it, but you know, once you want to go into details on how you configure this and all of this, right? That's all highlighted in the documentation where you have a comprehensive overview of all the enhancements that come uh, with the release as part of the release notes. Um, there's a specific page there that talks about the enhancements of a specific uh, version, and then from there you can drill into the specific doc pages that explain how you configure figure the feature, et cetera, right? So definitely worthwhile to look at um, at the release notes. Uh, and then overall, again, recommend that you uh, look at our Helix um, uh, page on bmc.com, right, where you learn more about the, specifically the add-on offerings that we, we have for Remedy, right, multi-cloud service management, cognitive automation, a chatbot, et cetera. Um, and then last but not least, of course, a lot of valuable information in the community spaces uh, themselves for uh, our Remedy ITSM suite, the three uh, are listed here, right? Um, so with that, uh, we have a few minutes at least for live questions. We had a lot of questions in the Q&A uh, module of WebEx. Um, but again, if there are, if there's anybody who wants to ask a live questions, we can certainly uh, address that as well in the remaining minutes. Yes, uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, SB, are you able to provide instructions for our callers to uh, signal us for questions? Yes, sir. If you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. A voice prompt on the phone line will indicate when your line is open. Please state your name before posing your question. Again, press star 1 to ask a question. While we're waiting, I can maybe address one question that I saw uh, recently coming up in the Q&A section that hasn't been answered yet. This is about the version numbering uh, system that we introduced. Again, 
we wanted to change that uh, to the, to reflect really our strategy of time-based releases that we you know do our releases on on a regular cadence again with uh, a six months going back to that six months cadence now uh, next next release 1902 would be expected by end of February uh, 2019 um, again our focus right now is not on making big technology changes um uh, in the platform etc right our main focus is on delivering valuable new features as part of these releases that's why we you know uh go with the terminology feature releases they're certainly different from a service pack they're certainly different from a major release that would um uh, introduce major changes right um our focus is on doing a cadence of feature releases and that's why we feel this numbering scheme, so to speak, um, or numbering approach has um, has benefits, right? As you can easily see when a certain release came out, um, it's also aligned with all the other DSM solutions that we have, and uh, it's it's uh, much easier to understand, so to speak, right? Yes, Any questions on the questions? phone? Hmm? Yes, sir, we'll take our first question. Caller, go ahead. Hello, uh, this is uh, Rajiv uh, from USDA. Uh, I have a question on uh, upgrade from 9.1 uh, service pack 2 uh, to uh, 8. Dot, uh, like 18.08. Uh, my question is, uh, can we use uh, country, uh, like uh, Docker to actually do the upgrade from 9 uh, to 18? Yes, yeah, as, as we stated before, at this point in time, the container version of the Remedy software is only available or used by BMC as part of our SaaS operations. It's not available to our general customer base on premise, um, so, so you wouldn't be able to do the upgrade for your Remedy installation in house uh, through um, the container software. Um, you know, as you know, if you are on nine one zero two today. And want to move to 1808 again for uh, the platform, including CMDB, as well as Smart IT. Depending on whether you use that or not, it would be a direct upgrade uh, to um, to 1808 using installers. For the ITSM applications, you would upgrade first to 1805 using the installer, and then you know apply the deployable package uh, that brings you from 1805 to 1808. That's the the general approach. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, th thanks for clarifying uh, that. My second question is on um, the remedy uh, SSO. Um, with the 1808, uh, does the Remedy SSO have the HA capability? And if we implement that, uh, like we have a true site implementation also here, uh, so will that cover uh, true site also if we implement uh, uh, 1808 uh, Remedy SSO? Who do you want to take that? Or? Yeah. So, uh, the Remedy SSO does include uh, HA uh, capabilities. Uh, the challenge that you are referring is specifically for uh, true site. You know the way uh, they have currently implemented it. So uh, Remedy SSO does support HA. Uh, you know quite a few of our customers use it uh, with you know the HA deployment. Uh, so I'll we'll have to you know check with true site as you know what are some of their plans for making uh, RSSO deployment. Work in HA for true site, but in, in general, RSSO is supported with uh, true site. It's specifically having the the question around HA that you wanted to clarify, right? Yeah, that's uh, yeah, true site Yeah, yeah. My 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 point is that we just want to implement Remedy SSO. And uh, use the same capability for remedy uh, tool site and uh, uh, analytics, and uh, so so that we have a common SSO for uh, both the products. Will that work yeah. with 1808? 
Yeah, in general, I mean, this has worked before. In general, you can use RSSO to uh, support true side and remedy. Yeah, that's possible. Uh, with a single, uh, like with with uh, the single, like uh, not the separate instance running for SSO for uh, true side and for remedy. Uh, we just want to run a single instance and have uh, it authenticate for true side and for remedy. Will that work? Yeah. Because currently it does not. No, it, yeah, it, it should, I are, guess, uh, we'd uh, have to open. Uh, yeah. If you are having a problem, it's probably best to open a support case so they could review it, make sure the versions and what you're trying to accomplish is understood, and that's probably the best place to troubleshoot that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. And at this time, we're at the uh, bottom of the hour we're over, and so wanted to thank all the presenters as well as our audience and panelists and uh, just to cover the self-help and contacting BMC. We do have a YouTube uh, channel, BMC Remedy and Discovery, as well as our knowledge base is available 24 hours a day for searches, and as well, technical support via web, phone, and email, as well as our social channels. And again, thank you for attending. This recording and Q&A will be posted within a week of today's live show. Thank you.